Awesome, we're all here. Excellent. So I think this is actually, if I'm not mistaken, episode nine. Yeah, wow. But you know, somebody told me, I'm not sure who it was, that uh, most podcasts don't do not make it past episode eight. Apparently, episode eight is like the the number where they all falter and die. Um, I thought I thought the good measure was when you forgot to count and you go, I don't know. How many is this? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty eight's pretty good. I'm impressed that a lot even get that far. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I don't know who told me that I forgot, but so is this the last episode? This this is episode nine. <laughs> we can just call it after this, and we're done. Yep. It's, All uh, right, good. Yeah. It's uh, we're Although, up by one. I'm getting approached by multiple people who want to be guests on on uh, on our chat, so uh, we need to somehow orchestrate that a bit better and make that happen. Make what happen. they want to join the podcast? Like they want to join as as like guest guests, uh, I guess cool. attendees. Yeah. Oh, just, just ordinary people, no superstars. Everyone can get a superstar on. <laughs> I mean, we're we're like the all in guys, aren't we? You know, we're going to have the runtime of every conference, aren't we? Sometimes. Hell we're... yes. Except our, <laughs> <laughs> ours won't be anywhere near as good as theirs. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Did you did you see some of the episodes and some of the some of the video coming out of it? No, I'm a bit out of the loop. They had one interview that sounded. That it's I wild. To it's insane. Yeah. I, I really have FOMO, and I'm going to make an effort to go next year. Hmm. Uh, I, I couldn't this year. There's just too much going on with new business. But uh, next year, I think I'm going to somehow make time to go just for that. It just just looked amazing. There's so many good presenters, um, and yeah, just so much inspiration in that room. So, hmm. whereabouts was it held? It was in San Francisco, I think. Oh, yep. I'm not mistaken. Um, I don't. I, I'm pretty sure. Definitely somewhere in California. <laughs> All right. And I'm in. Let's do it. You want to go? Let's go. <laughs> yeah. We could take Runtime Reverie to we, All In. We, we can do it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I liked it. Some of the, just the, um, they've been recording some of the snippets on there and uh, putting it, interestingly, uh, on Twitter only. So they're literally putting some of the content from that on Twitter. Yeah, well, they're friends with Musk, aren't they? They're trying to give him a yeah, yeah. Yeah. buddies with Musk. Completely yeah. unbiased decision that one was. Yeah, yeah. And the, I watched the episode with with Musk on there, and he's you know they ask him where are you? He's like, oh, I'm on my jet flying from where X to Y. Right? I don't know. Where. And um, literally from X. <laughs> <laughs> but so, so he was on his jet flying probably to a Tesla you know meeting, uh, talking using Starlink. Which he mm. owns with SpaceX uh, about Twitter, which he owns. <laughs> it was just it was fantastic. Um, it was actually a really good talk. He made he said something really interesting. He said the what he's trying to do with the platform is he really wants Twitter to become the place for long form conversation and long form content. He doesn't want it to be the place for links that take you away to other things. So he wants you to put the video there. He wants you to put the whole article there. He wants you to put everything. In. Isn't that just called a walled garden? No, I don't. I don't think so. I don't think there's a wall. Um, mm. It's not working. What Twitter isn't <laughs> working? Yeah, whatever he's doing to try and reach that goal, it ain't going in that direction. I think it is. All the metrics oh, are going up, dude. No way. All no the way. metrics are going up. Screen, like, like just screen time, usage time, advertising. It's all going up. It's all trending. Not I don't, I don't know where you got those stats from, but they definitely don't match the Cloudflare stats. I got um, it from the video of him talking about it. Of, yeah. of him talking, yeah. I, I would I, I would put low value on those numbers. Yeah, right, okay. I don't. Uh, he's, uh, he's shown a penchant that whatever works for him is what matters, um, but not necessarily 100%. Highly open, but not necessarily honest with himself too. Like you can see the Cloudflare metrics where the, uh, the amount of traffic that goes to Twitter is just off a cliff. Really? You know, yeah, like, and you, you go. That's that's at least, that. Yeah, I'll I'll find it um, and, and drop a link in. But yeah, like that's an objective thing that you can get to see and watch. And but also like when you use the app yourself, it's like it's not like it was, you know. Um, but who would have thought if you have a product that's built with thousands of developers and then you get rid of seventy percent of them, that something's just not going to be as glossy. Like to me, the, the amazing bit is to the credit of the people who work there is it's still running it's still there mostly like they did great work 
Yeah. I'd go. I'd actually say the opposite. I'd say in the last year they've released more features and more changes to the product than in the previous five easily. Uh, just, Twitter so, was buggered before, so yeah, yeah. It was, like it, anyway. they've just done so much more change, and it, I I think it's dramatically better. The experience, the app is dramatically better, and I think the content and the posts are dramatically better. At least what I'm seeing wow. in my little bubble, and it is a bubble. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I'll 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 swap your user accounts. So I'll I'll be you for a day. You be me for a day. Yeah. There is no <laughs> way that ecosystem has improved. I'm still I'm still addicted to it, but I find that the I mean the discourse has never been that great on it uh, in the sort of tech world because people are just looking for attention. But it's it's surprisingly consistent for me since he took it over. Doesn't mean it's great. Yeah, but yeah, it hasn't. I haven't deleted, you know, haven't stopped using it, which I found surprising. Mm. Yeah, interesting. Anyway, uh, that's Twitter. <laughs> what are we actually talking about today? What's on the What's on the ticket? Well, Patrick hasn't been working on anything for the last week or two. He's been oh, he's too being a tourist around the world. So, uh, yeah, it's been nice. Is the conference yeah. finished now, Pat? What's that? Sorry, is the conference finished and and everyone's excited about Elixir and Elixir is going to take over the world? Yeah, it's an interesting, interesting scene there because it's. Um, I wasn't really there for the beginning of the Ruby sort of wave. Probably, if I was smart, I would have caught that. Like, I probably would have caught the iOS wave and all sorts of waves. But um, it's. I think a lot of people know each other there, so it's not as big as it could be. They had a lot of machine learning stuff. Um, they showed a type system, um, sort of not quite like TypeScript, but sort of some of the same ideas. I uh, got to meet a lot of people, like the people creating this stuff. So that was really cool. That's awesome. Uh, yeah. So um, meet, so you, you met some of the devs working on it? Yeah, like met the creator of the Blixer language, met the oh, creator of the Phoenix Really? Like in person, a conversation with him? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh. they, even after the – I had I did my talk, and then they're sitting at the front, and then they're like afterwards like, hey, come down, like, you know, got some – you know, Jose had written up some notes of ideas of – what do you do with my library? So that was pretty cool. That I'm not sure thing. if I can't, I need a, I'm not sure if I remember them all, but um, I tried to remember as much as I could. <laughs> and um, yeah, so that was cool. It'd be interesting to pair with people who have built different things because they were just bringing in a skill set that you don't get to work with on a day to day basis, right? Most of us don't get to work on languages or language parts. I mean, you do a little bit, Patrick, but um, you know, I build apps for people to use, right? I use the tools that those people make. So you don't get to work with those people, you know, pairing on those, you know, yeah. th there's a, you know, there's, there's something to be gained by working with just super smart people who work on something so different. Mm. Yeah. Well, they're, and they're interesting. Oh, you go, I mean, I was just going to say, so it, my reflection on that is that's just to tie back to the previous conversation. That's how I've created my little Twitter bubble. So when I, you know, when I look at other things like, you know, Reddit and LinkedIn and whatever, they're, they're all like entertainment and tripe and just a bunch of noise. But uh, Twitter, I've created a little bubble of people that give me interesting ideas and inspiration. And yeah. that's how it's working for me. So I, I get, and it's not very many, but the people I see that I, I follow very purposefully uh, give me some interesting ideas and this good conversation around you know ideas. And it's the closest I can get to sitting next to them and talking to them, mm. them. but I'm, I'm not physically there. I don't even really know them that well. Mm. Yeah, well, that's are, what I find as well. Like who, who promote well, right, who are good communicators, not mm. just good developers, but I, I always thought that there's the, there's the quiet ones who are just, you know, mm. have this quiet genius about them and go, I don't need to get onto Twitter. I don't need to get into that. They're the people I like to seek out. Yeah, and they have an outsized contribution often, right? But how yeah. do you, mm -hmm. how do you, you know, collaborate with them? How do you communicate with them? Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm chatting with a former UI designer for um, Apple, and I think it's like 1999 to 2005. So that's been kind of cool. Like just ask him how, you know, just ask him some questions this morning, and he replied. And he, so he's saying like how he used to do like review meetings with Steve Jobs, and he was, you know. They're pretty hard meetings by the sound of it. And they used to print stuff out on paper, which I found surprising. I'm not sure if they're like sketches or high fidelity, but that's, I mean, that was sort of surprising to me that that's what they were reviewing. But um, it's just cool. Like, you know, I'm not going to be able to meet this Still person. A, but I can, 
it's still a good skill to have that paper right I, I don't know but i like actually printing stuff out and actually just sticking it on the wall right because it's not like a phone which turns off like you've got to consciously go in to do that but there's something where you're just sitting back and mulling on this concept on the on the wall and you know walk past it like time cures all you know you can't just like bake something great without it having time to cure you know and often often yeah. the, so i'm not so hot on this idea anymore after a week you, you know the, the, and you start to see the problems with it you start to think about how it would work through and then you just go nah whereas if it was on the phone you look at it you prove it and then you start building it and then you work out later through av testing you yeah it's pretty garbage hmm. didn't work like the way I yeah thought. stupid humans not behaving the way i imagined <laughs> I brought some offline mode um, articles for me to read. I think they call them magazines. I brought them on the plane, so that was pretty handy. Didn't need a battery. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but the, the plane was in darkness the whole time, so I couldn't I couldn't read them. You know, there's a little light usually. That's what it's for. It's to read stuff on paper. Yeah, but everyone was the backlight. <laughs> everyone was sleeping, and I just didn't want to be rude. But um, yeah, watch a lot of movies. That was good. <laughs> the, um, but yeah, the, what was it like getting to What's florida that? did you just have a, a you know endless flights or did you were they okay yeah i was flying with pointis which um there's a lot of news while i was away that they're um going down the toilet a bit but um yeah that so the flight got delayed on the way over they had to change the tire um which is interesting you know do they jack it up or you know how does that work but um yes yeah, so it's delayed a couple of hours going out and then the and then the lady on the plane, the hostess, gives me a piece of paper saying, hey, what was before? One flight is now two. So yeah, I got there pretty late. I was pretty tired. And um, yeah, it was delayed coming back as well. So um, I think I've heard that Alan Joyce has left now, which makes What's me quite happy. I missed the news there. What, what happened? Yeah, Joyce is uh, out because um, they were selling tickets to flights that were already pre-cancelled. And, yeah, that uh, was terrible. It, and basically, reputation has imploded all the way down. Right? It's one of those, you know, that those concepts of that thermocline of trust, where it's just gone beyond a certain level that it's quite not recoverable now. So he's uh, he's he's off the plane, and um, new uh, CEOs jumped in and has to try and deal with the mess. Right. I've heard, yeah. I've heard he's off the plane and he's currently walking between one of the Jetstar terminals and the and the gate. But you know, it might take him a few days. I, I, I think some of the uproar was also that uh, you go after sacking 1,700 people illegally, um, you know, um, not refunding people's money for COVID times uh, and actually then pre-selling flights that didn't exist that people are pretty annoyed that he gets like uh, one and a half million or something like that in free flights first class on a regular basis. And all the... Plus and all a $10 these million dollar are... bonus, yeah. All these politicians are getting their their uh, nice uh, lounge access and all sorts of nice yes. stuff. And that was yeah, yeah. Well, these are the same politicians that approved a loan to Qantas during COVID. Do you know how much that was? I, I know a loan. Yeah, I, yes, know. Yes, I, know. I know how much it cost them. It cost them all the tickets for the one side of the referendum campaigners yeah. to be given free flights around. And you just go, oh come on, that's just corruption. But you know, there's there's <laughs> no word for that. You go, come on. Why, why, what made you think that that was a winning strategy for Qantas? Mm. It was so uh, I, I was, gr I grew up in a time when um, Australia's like, um, like Telstra and Qantas and stuff were public companies and were privatized. And so mm. um, I'm, st I know, like, I, I'm sure people have opinions on that, but like when they got that, when they got that handout, like, why does the government not get shares in Qantas? Why, yeah. why are they just? It's just totally messed up. It is. It's completely broken, right? So, this is uh, like they should. I mean, the one way to think about it is, yeah, the government could just get shares, but like literally buy buy some equity. Uh, and yeah. Because then they would dilute the shareholders, and the shareholders don't want to get diluted because, you know, rich people like to stay rich. It's just. I think it's just blatant yeah. corruption. Whereas I think that's what um, Obama did with Ford during mm -hmm. that bailout time, where they basically took shares of that entity it resurrected itself and then they started divesting in themselves slowly to get themselves back out of there again yeah if you think about it the, yeah, the, the, yeah the justification is it's too big to fail so we can't let Qantas fail because it's the yeah. national yeah. airline right? but which is ridiculous because let's say it fails who gets hurt if it fails not the nation because we still have the planes and the people and the expertise who gets hurt 
the investors and shareholders, right? They get hurt. What, what would happen? Well, the investors and shareholders would get wiped out because they screwed up and they lost lots of money and they went broke and the government didn't bail them. And what would happen? Another company would come in, take over the, the assets, mm. the physical assets, the planes, the terminals, all the stuff and, you know, take over. And then out comes a new airline with a clean, clean balance sheet and carries on. We would still have an airline. It would just wipe out the shareholders. Yeah, it, work, just, it just seemed no, crummy no, to have long-term profits. Sorry? Was it Warren Buffett who said no airline has ever made like long-term profits or long-term value? You know, yeah. Just mm. don't get in them. Um, yeah, I I think that's a contested <laughs> position. But it's, yeah, uh, yeah it's, it's something I know very little about. And uh, You should read, there's a great um, biography I, I read I know, decades ago. Um, uh, by well, Richard Branson. He, I think he actually, I think it was an autobiography. Mm. Mm. Mm, I forget what it was called, but it was, it was his first one. It was a really long time ago. I'm sure you could look it up. I'll look it up in a second. But uh, he talks about how he, you know, built his music business, and then he basically sold it all just to get the money to do yeah. Virgin Airlines, and why he got into the air industry. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure he didn't do it because, you know, it was money losing he did it because he thought he could he could win yeah yeah well Qantas had what two billion dollars profit like left over like it's massive just yeah but there's a thing like when you got like all like you do it with what we do right where if you keep jacking up prices and don't add value and you start having outages and things the trust in your product starts to wane right and then it gets to a point where no, it just but Below that, and it's no airline. airlines, right? The airlines have been doing surge pricing like Uber. You know, school holidays have just come now, prices have gone to triple, people don't trust it. And then you throw out a few of these other little bits, and people have just gone, We used to love Qantas, <laughs> we loved it so deeply, and now stuff them. Yeah, it, yeah I, but the, it's sorry. effectively a duopoly, isn't it? Like, they, I don't no, know. The, the yeah, but technical... the other way, the only way they protect that is with government. Uh, but acting as the bodyguard, you know, Qatar wanted to come in and the government said, no, you know, we'll make up a reason. And but there um, must be like, I don't know the technical definition of price fixing, but they must, they, they're, they're it, doing it. Behaves, it it's together. behaving the same as petrol prices. They're behaving yeah. the same. Uh, you'll see it in um, supermarkets, uh, you know, algorithmic pricing on certain stuff. Like, do you really need to change the price on a bottle of Pepsi three times a day? You don't. And is yet, that happening now? Is that really happening now? Yeah. You can go in in the morning and there'll be a different price when you go in at night. And then they'll start doing like, hey, one for $1.70. They'll, they'll pick amounts that you can't do the mental maths in your head on to work it out. But in the little spine print, they've got the unit pricing because they're forced to do that. Hmm. Um, but why do you keep changing it? Like, and you'll see them doing it cross with other product lines. So like with uh, soft drink, you'll have the three litre bottle, you, the cans, the other bits, and you can watch the human behavior on that of that algorithmic, and people are price sensitive on that stuff. They're just going to do the cheapest every single time. And you go, well, what are you trying to learn, guys? Why do you keep doing that? And what happens? You can't trust them. You know that they're doing it. It's blatantly obvious. You can't trust it. Side product, people still beyond belief at the moment with the supermarkets, you know, and they're going, it's a huge problem. They can't do that. Well, we got rid of our staff, so you have to do self-serve checkout, and now, we keep jacking the prices up, and now people go stuff them. I'm just going to steal it. I, that was in the news this last week, right? That there's yeah. a lot of people apparently doing that. I, I still can't believe why self-service checkouts are a thing. Mm -hmm. they, they've been a complete disaster. Uh, I can't stand them. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why we're still trying to do that. Well, what I hate is you go, you've asked me to do all the work, and then you want to come and double check that I did the work properly because you don't trust me. And you go, well, yeah. what are you do it now. So then now they're going to have cameras checking, watching you at I've every. I've been caught by them. All right, like I don't know if you've seen them. Like the person comes up, you know, it's it stops scanning. So you go boop, and you put it in. All right, so I had loose sleeves on on my jumper, right, and it sort of covered up half of on your hoodie the packet I was putting into the bag, and it goes no 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 you snuck something in all right oh, and God. so the assistant comes over punches the magic operator number all right and it comes up and it shows the video of you scanning it and Whoa. so I sat there for like 10 minutes ago you didn't scan that i go yes it is there it is on the receipt 
you know, and they go, oh, well, it must have been the one before. You go, no, there it is on the receipt. And it comes up to the morning and go, why don't you unpack it, you repack it for me, and then you let me know when it's good. And then they just go, oh, forget it. Go through. You know, it's but now it's got AI on it too, right? So they're trying to determine the difference between like a gala apple and a pink lady apple. All right, so that you don't scan one through and say it's the cheaper one, or oh, right. yeah, like, so a it's funny banana or a regular banana. And I've yeah, that's why I boycotted um I boycotted calls because they only have predominantly self checkout, just because I I don't want to deal with that crap. Um, I, I don't want to be responsible for for that. It's not my job. I don't want to try and mess it up. I want to go and buy something without having to be hassled for many things such as um, electronic begging. Well, it's to our charity. Why does every large company with a massive set of profits <laughs> keep asking me for money? I'm yeah, no. just buying a bag of lettuce. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Do you want to sign up for our subscription? We're going to put you on the rewards program. I go, it's a bag of lettuce. I just want to buy a bag of lettuce. <laughs> Let me go. Um, but even like, you know, it's all tracked. They've got all the data. Mm. Right, so you know you're being tracked within an inch of your life, and I don't know if you watch Macquarie Bank, no cash anymore. You yeah. know, literally yeah. a cashless bank. Right? Yeah. What What does that actually mean? They're not going to have cash from their um. No oh, ATMs. Like, well, no ATMs will still have like dispense it. Yeah, but, but you, you you they they won't have their own ATMs. They're doing that through you know the if you go to a third party, that's the only spot you can get cash out at. But they'll, don't worry, they will charge you. Off you know what the I, the real problem I have with um. With, with cashless, I, I mean, I actually think it's it is far more convenient. It's great, except Australia has some of the world's highest payment fees. We're somewhere between one mm. and two percent. In most of the developed world, where they have gone cashless and they've used it for a while, they regulate that stuff down to 0.1 percent or fractions. Mm. It's it's just it's ridiculous that, that they take you know one and a half two percent of all your money of of, of, of an entire nation's transactions. That's right. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Yeah. So in most other developed nations, it is it is fractions of a of a percentage. Um, Australia is just not on top of that, and letting the banks get away with murder, it's ridiculous. But it's funny, like when we went to the states recently. I don't know if you saw this, Patrick, but like it it sticks out so wild how different like Australia and the US are with financial systems. Mm. Like cash is everywhere there, right? Um, checks are really important. Um, you know, like. Either it's like going back 10, 15 years. Oh, I didn't, get I didn't get it. Machines and stuff. Whereas here, you just go, oh my God, like it, it's cashless everywhere. Yeah. I didn't understand. Can you can you guys hear me? Yeah. 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 yeah did I, I didn't understand. Like I would like eat at a restaurant or whatever, and then I'd give them my card and then I'd bring it back and then like have to sign my signature. And then I'd like give a tip and I'm and it's yeah. like, you would give a tip after I was like, I think I realized like I'm not actually paying them. They're basically recording the credit card number down yeah. and then later on, like doing all the transactions later. It's like, what? That's so insecure. It's yeah. A, it, yeah, that was a bit what got me with the security of it. You're going in, you're getting a stake and you go, we're going to write all this down. You go, oh no, that's bad. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> you know, you know, they're supposed to destroy the number right afterwards, but I wonder. Yeah. Yeah, that was always an issue. It still is an issue. Yeah. That's yeah, why they got rid of how do they just how do they destroy it? Like they must have a paper shredder. By they literally have a pile of credit card numbers. But like, couldn't you just search their trash and then get access to all these? Yep, I'm sure. I'm sure no one's ever done that ever, Patrick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so old fashioned. And you know, the we best thing is if you try and transfer money. money between banks. You try and do that in America, and you'll you'll start laughing. Yeah, yeah right like we've been back we were battling with like those three-day transfer windows that we used to have here you know a long time ago uh, but it's also a, a symptom of trying to get a large number of banks like they got like a hundred thousand banks uh was the last estimate i sort of had as a rough guide uh, whereas we've got like four big players right they're not just big mm. banks they're big banks on a global scale but they dominate it so if you're going to get four people in a room and say all right you guys we're going to do this we're going to phase this out. What do you need? How much time do you want? It's easy to regulate compared to trying to get 100,000 CEOs in a room and saying, we should do this. You know, it's nearly you're saying So you're saying we should be we should be happy that we have Coles and Woolworths, Geoffrey and Virgin and Qantas. Australia it makes things is, easier. Australia is a country of duopolies. You know? Yeah, we are a bit. 
We, we yeah. there's not many things, or you can say there's not a, a large duopoly at play somewhere. Mm. MYOB and zero. <laughs> yeah, or, mm. you know, Tulsa and Optus, your telco providers, and you know, the one big thing we did with that was the NBN to try and break that up a bit. You know, it was more mm. billing play more than the technical one half the time. Um, oh, what a disaster that's been. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what a disaster. Uh, I think it's all going to go. Um, it's all going to be, you know, basically satellite. I, I can't imagine that stuff will stick around very much longer. Yeah, long, mm. long as you had a billionaire turn it off on us. Well, you worry yeah. he will. <laughs> I, I don't he, trust him. Yeah. Yeah, he, he's not him. I, I trust him more than uh, most, actually, ever, anyone. That's oh, that's politicians. No, I don't trust him at all. I wouldn't trust him with my life or anything. No, no. Really? Way. No. No, Why, what you, the guy's he's meddled, he's meddled in with the Ukraine war to try and deny yeah, people access to Stalin yeah. because he thought, oh, Russia told me it's it, all going to be bad. And got, it was it, it, to Russia. It was literally yeah. illegal for him to to deploy that into Crimea. It was against U.S. law. No, it wasn't. Yes, it that's was. What, Crimea what, was U.S. considered Crimea part of Russia and was illegal to provide no, satellite no, to no, Russia. Go look no, it up. No, Crimea not Go part look of Russia. Crimea Go look definitely up. part of Ukraine. Recognized by the U.S. Absolutely, no way in hell. I look it up. It was illegal for him to do it. Yep, um, it's a, it's the same as uh, you know they're saying you can't. If we send you weapons, you can't use them on Russia. And they go, yeah, but what about Crimea? Yeah, that's all right. That's yours. You know, that's why there's a reason the Pentagon took control of it because they didn't want him to be able to turn things off. I'm reading. I'm reading an interview because you can get access to the New Yorker like months, like when it actually comes out in America, rather than like months. In the past here i'm reading an in, uh, article on musk's power and there's they're like interviewing people at like the agencies in america and they're literally saying like oh i have to check with elon musk first before i talk to you to get the go-ahead because i don't know if he's going to be happy about this and they're reporting things back to him like what exactly has been said what questions are being asked in this interview like he's got a lot of power right now that's pretty too, scary too much too much yeah it's you know uh, you can understand why I someone disagree. in his position would want to do that if you think you're smart you go well this is great but it's yeah i'm a bit concerned about it oh my god i do not want to get into politics we're here for five hours hey let's talk about email patrick give me a count how many emails are in your inbox right now oh, i got no idea you can round it to the nearest 10 if you want yeah. emails in your inbox or emails unread because um, I can't count my inbox. Uh, that's just a technical impossibility. But I do have a red bubble number. Oh my god! <laughs> I've got. It says one thousand three hundred nineteen, but then at the pagination thing, it says three thousand two hundred sixty-two, which I both imagine a low because I just don't archive or delete most of them. So I think Craig's got you beat, Craig. What's um, your number? Unread at the moment is. 16,713. But look, in my defense, in a month or two, I'll just select all and move it all to archive and it'll be zero. I'm in really my defense, I'm just I'm just waiting for AI to just tell me what they all are. You know, you can just summarize them all. <laughs> okay, hold on. So um, do you guys remember that movie Her from a few years ago? Yeah, yeah. The, the very first thing the AI does when he installs the, the new AI on his computer is it cleans up his email and <laughs> wipes the slate clean. <laughs> Hold on, but Craig, if you're going to do that in two months, why not do it right now? Just do select all archive. Oh, I haven't read them yet. <laughs> I'm not going to read them. You're yeah, not going to read those. But a lot of them, a lot of them are junk ones. Like you just scan through in the morning, you pick out the actual legit ones, and you just action it straight away, and then I just move on. Like to me, yeah, when email, you action it, can you not just you know when you open it, does it not mark it as read? Yeah, they're the unread ones, the sixteen. Oh, so you literally have no idea what what is inside you don't know about no, that. No, yeah let, let's not count how many there are, are actually in there it's wow. okay. insane but um for work most of it is on slack right so well, okay so let's let's take a, let's you yeah, know interesting poll here i guarantee you you're not alone there's obviously many people who also ignore their inbox and they're just just out of control um there's also People like myself who tried to do the inbox zero thing and you know, religious and meticulous about it. What do you think the split is? 
And do you think it is actually split between out of control and zero, or are there some people? See, uh, mine's not out of control. control. In the middle. Mine's not out of control. I, I control it well. I actually did do the uh, inbox zero thing and made sure everything was actioned and all of that. I spent a lot of time and effort on it, and then I worked out I was spending a lot of time and effort on it. Hmm. I don't need to do any of that and be the slave to the tool. I'm just going to scan through in the morning. Go, yep, 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 yep. In yeah, the I'm doing next, next morning, I got I got all the unreads in the top list, and you just go that one. What have we got? Yeah, done, done. Move it and just walk away. The fact that it has an annoying bubble, I wish I could just turn it off. Other than that, it's perfect. I'm I'm using Inbox Zero. I give zero shits about it. <laughs> so, but, but genuinely, do you think it's like a 50-50 split? Do you think half the world uh, doesn't care and the other half does? I don't think. I it's reckon 50, it's 50. like yeah, 80, think, 20, yeah, yeah 80 percent. Yeah. You think eighty percent don't care? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I so reckon like. Well, okay, so and no, then, I think I agree with you. It's probably eighty percent don't care. Uh, how many people do you think? Um, do you think for which email is actually a use like a practical way of communicating? So if you want to say something to someone mm. that they, they would see the email and read it. I don't think would, would just get live live without I don't think anyone could live without email at the moment. All right. Like everyone has an email address. You know, everyone has email. Mm. Um the extent to which they manage it, yeah, it's how the extent how people manage anything in life, right? Mm. It's um is everyone's got various degrees of doing things different levels of importance what to work on yeah I'm like you're like you've got kids right like you've got like what does your son like if you looked at because like people sign up to social media and they need an email well, i guess but, well, like, my, but the, the kids the kids very rarely use email um, my daughter manages it well but doesn't actually use it as a method of communication but she all read all it chat and stuff you know so amongst their all their thing is all short, sharp, instantaneous communication, Snapchat. Everything else that comes into the email is because they're forced to have to use email or send something out and, and get it or, you know, like uh, permissions forms for schools and those sort of things. And uh, to be yeah, honest, my painful. daughter is the most organised person I know but doesn't use email. It's painful as well. Like you'll go to something and I say like, hey, we have to send you an email to verify this thing. It's like, oh, God, <laughs> so pain painful and like, if you use your phone, like there's a chance it'll page out the app, like you'll switch to your email app and then you'll be waiting and then it'll come through and then you click on the link and then there's like a chance well, that the, uh, the deliverability stats are also, you know, it, it's an art form to get things actually delivered, right? So seeing mm. an email is not a simple thing as what it used to be in the beginning where you'd send it and it would send, eventually get there. It, these days, you know, you've got, you know, your trust scores, trust on IP addresses, you can't just spin up a new server and a new provider you got to warm up the ips uh you know spam detection putting images in wrong you know it'll get clobbered styles yeah so i'll, I'll give you the alternate view uh, mm. right because this is where i i absolutely disagree I, I have a very different view on email email to me is a universal to-do inbox and it is absolutely fantastic it is the most powerful tool i have it is the primary reason i carry this thing around uh it is it, it's it's everything because all the things I use, all the whatevers, all the services, all the everything, they all just flow into one one place. They get filtered mm. appropriately. The noise tends to go away. I don't see crap because systems and tools get rid of most of the crap, and I just see a flow of things I need to pay attention to. And I'll I'll as you said, Craig, I'll do it, and then I just hit the delete button. It's probably one extra thing I do that you don't do, but um, that's it. But it works so well for me because across literally decades, it has been the universally uh, constant mode of uh, sort of communication that's worked. And it works reliably and it works flawlessly and it's simple. And so I, I don't want anyone to touch it or mess with it or change it, it works. It, it's, it's not going anywhere. It's evolved too, right? And it's evolving more these days. But, you know, there was the promise of Slack getting rid of, you know, we, we're going to get rid of email. Uh, now I've got now I've got another tool that behaves just like email. Yeah, it's actually worse. It's just moved yeah. the problems into this other thing where you can't search it or find it or it's just yeah. a mess. And craves Correct. more attention. It's designed to actually drag you into that rather than allow you to do your work. To That's a right. Degree. Yeah, my email client doesn't have an annoying bubble. <laughs> it's, Try finding an old Slack message. It's, it's horrible. It's a, you can't find it. 
Oh, remember that conversation about blah, blah, blah? And you like scroll, scroll, scroll. You, or you would try and search and then we'll find it. But then you're like, there's some associated messages around this. And you're like, oh, no, this is just horrible. Yeah. But with email, like, you can literally say, I want to find the email from this person in this date range of this size with this attachment that had these words in it. And you'll find it. It never usually, I, that works about 50% of the time for me. Often I can't find the email. That's, yeah. Really? Yeah, that's, I think this is part of the reason why I don't. I just don't, yeah. I, I, I found emails dec like literally like a decade afterwards and I can still find the exact thing I want. I, all I basically do is I file emails that anything that's like a receipt, I will label it and then everything else I just like ignore. <laughs> and then, yeah. That One thing I will agree with you on, I think where we hopefully are going is we will have, a, a whether it's AI or just, just better tools, we will have, um, more sophisticated sorting and sorting and filtering and um, automation around it. So you won't have to deal with so much of the noise. So all the stuff you ignore, Craig, I suspect the system will just be better at not even showing you that stuff. Yeah, and it, it, it's, it's evolved so much from just that one mission of trying to get rid of spam email with Bayesian filtering, right? Where it would just basically classify, oh yeah, that's junk. Or if you drag it into a junk folder, it would train the big filter in the sky. You know, now it's going, oh, that's a newsletter from this one. This is a newsletter from that, you know, and starting to really classify those things out. It's better. It's, yeah, that's, it, 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 does, it doesn't work for me because for me, yeah, e email is a good thing for transactional stuff. Like I do enjoy getting the newsletters in there and I go through them and, you know, I don't unsubscribe from everything and just every now and then a nugget will come in, which is good. I get my bills sent there, all of that sort of stuff. But if I'm trying to actually accomplish something you know it's not a mechanism for communicating ideas you know it's just definitely not even slack's not for me you know the if you want to get something done and do it got to get into on uh, you know either onto discord or on a, on a zoom call or something similar to ours and you know mm. actually walk it through uh, and heck even in person can't hurt yeah interesting if you were building a completely remote team that was all remote from the start and it was designed to be remote. How would you set up the communication tools and, and modes? Oh, right. Like you have some of that experience now with a, you know, yep. some of your team is remote and different. We, different we're content. really remote. All right? And some of us, is, some of it is actually going to be more geolocated going forward because it makes actually pairing and that cross collaboration a bit easier. You know, when, when your days and nights do not overlap, it makes life really hard. And so, you know, it's hard to communicate on a pull request, right? Because you're waiting for a day for someone to go, oh, but is this the case? Wait for the earth to rotate again? No, you know, it's just too slow. So you need to have decision centers and, and autonomy within in regions for people to do that and get that info back. But yeah, for me, the video conferencing is the thing, right? Really? Yeah. yeah uh, right. I think there's a, there's a lost mm. art of written communication. Mm. So, you know, if you look at how lots of uh, pro prominent open source projects are done, they're basically mm -hmm. mailing lists, they're email mailing lists. Mm -hmm. You want to get something discussed, uh, you know, RFCs, all of it. But there's so much technical conversation that happens through formal written communication. You sit down, you think mm -hmm. about exactly what needs to be said, you write it down, you review it, you change it, and then you, you know, you throw it out there and you wait a day. Yeah, maybe you wait a week until you get responses that are all well thought out and reasoned and come back to you. Uh, you, you, you mean not just like doing an emoji reaction in Slack and then a quick comment? Looks good. Yeah, here's a couple of emojis. So yeah, I'm, 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 I'm the opposite. I mean, I, I, I try to keep that as, as a low percentage mm. of, of the mechanisms um, because you don't get as many iterations in as possible, right? I much prefer the chaos style of doing things. And the, as the guy from NVIDIA, who's explaining how he runs his company. And I, I really appreciated that. Not, not having OKRs, not having those sorts of things. Uh, meetings, just say it, right? Because by the time you write it up and present it, all of the good information is filtered out, like just blurt it all out and just do it. And that comes from those like core values of, you know, do you have a safe way of actually putting forward an idea and everyone's gonna go, yeah, thinking out loud is okay because you have dumb thoughts. Right, and you got to find go through those dumb thoughts sometimes to get to the, the the right nuggets of ideas. And how do you prototype something and test it? Things that look good when you go and do it don't work so good. I, you know, I so would love to work 
in a place that did have good email culture. Like my ideal place, probably every major decision would have an email sent out, and then like you don't encourage people just to reply with this fluff, but just like you could go to that email inbox and sort of like see like a yeah. a bit so of a I, history. I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'd love to have that. Stories. Uh, one, uh, and, and again, I don't know if these are exactly like that now, but they were historically. So when, when I was at Microsoft, the, you know, they had, and granted this is a while ago, but they had an amazing email culture. Every new person that joins, you, you literally go through a training program and you learn how to email properly because it's not what you think. And you learn to do it properly and then you do it that way and it works so incredibly well. Um, I've heard stories coming out of Amazon that they have a great email culture. The best one I heard was, uh, uh, one of my friends there said he he uh, basically created and collaborated and built an entire feature in AWS from start to end. So start as in conception to, you know, developing the idea, all the models, approvals, collaborating with all the teams to this infrastructure sitting in a uh, server farm somewhere, all of it in one email chain. And you, you can do that and it works incredibly it's well. It's why the, if you why the Kindle kind of looks like ascii art if you're wondering by the way yeah is it designed yeah. it in an email <laughs> i I'm, I'm i'm the opposite all right if someone if i was looking for to take on a new project and they said look we've got this fantastic email culture I go, thanks but no thanks i'm out all right really i'd be okay because the, the problem with email is that there's so much crap it's free so there's, there's so much shit that goes into the inbox and then i just ignore, i just turn it off yeah. i just ignore it like you sign up to you, Go into a new client, and then it's like, here's your new email inbox, and then here's your Slack, and here's blah blah. blah. And you sign up for like ten services, and they all yeah. start emailing you. And, like, and this is this is a, this is I think a modern problem. And many many uh, modern, I don't want to say modern, many many current product businesses that I've experienced with, they have the exact thing. They don't define their email culture, so they get lots of noise and lots of crap. They don't define their meeting culture, so they get lots of noise and lots of crap. They don't define many many aspects of how people work very well and they sort of stay at the very surface level of oh we want to have a good culture what does that mean oh we just hang out on fridays and have lunch and talk crap and you know that's our culture well hold on culture is also how you communicate and mm. you know how you're literally down to the nitty-gritty like what are the rules around when to bcc someone if you do it wrong that's not okay Right, uh, and, and, and that's the that's the nugget, right? Email is the medium, right? Communication is the thing that you are trying to do, right? right? And then short, concise communications. Like when I first write something, it's like if I'm talking to you, long, verbose, too many words, a lot of wrong things, right? And then that condensing to try and get it down to that that level of brevity that actually conveys that simple fact quickly, short, sharp, less than a paragraph. And if you can't distill it down into a paragraph, then Go back and think it through you know you're wasting people's time you know and and saying you know the all the politeness and stuff so there's multiple communication strategies you know on slack it's like talking right but actually those great communication cultures from people like amazon with their six pager format was literally constrained to you you got to keep it under six you got to have this structure you got to you know mm. say what's in it for the business what you're going to do how it's going to be done and that forces you to get to the point you know, um, they, 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 there's an example of them defining the way they want to run meetings and their culture around that very particularly. And mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's it's you know you have to have it written. You could you know it could be a culture of communication around verbal or face to face or in person that you that could absolutely be the thing. But most businesses are not particular about it, and so chaos. Yeah. Yeah. I got to check out of this uh, hotel, but um, yeah, that was a really good chat. Great conversation, guys. Let's um. Let's power on and uh, see you all later. All right. Cool. Look forward to the next one. <laughs> okay. Catch you. Bye. See you.